good morning and good afternoon, depending on when you're, where you're joining us from. My name is Larissa Green. I'm with Advanta IRA, and we would like to welcome you to our webinar today with guest Bill Tan talking about RAP loans. He's going to uncover this strategy for us in just a few minutes. Again, thank you everybody for joining. A couple of things I want to make everybody aware of. Um, if you would like the slides, they are attached as a handout, so just go ahead and look at your control panel there. You'll see handouts and you can download the slides. You can do that now or throughout the webinar, so you'll have the ability to follow along with us and save those for a later date. I also want to let everybody know that I am going to keep the webinar muted, um, but the um, you, you do have the ability to ask questions. So if you have questions, you'll see the question box there. I am monitoring those. You can ask questions throughout. We will get to those as we go. So go ahead and feel free to type any questions into the chat box. This is also being recorded. So if you have to leave before the end or you want to share the recording with somebody, you'll have the ability to do that. Um, it will go um, directly to your email. So whatever email address you use to register, you'll receive the recording. If you don't see it, let us know. I'll make sure to get it over to you. Um, I had a question about the handouts. Um, again, look at your control panel there. You'll see handouts in there and you'll be able to download them. They're saved as a PDF. My name is Larissa Green. I'm with Advana IRA. I've been with Advana for um, 10 years now and I started out doing uh, back office work, check coding, new accounts, transfers, helping people with transactions. And about eight years ago, I transferred over to education and business development, where I have been doing networking and basically sales for Advanta IRA for um, that time going forward. And I've really enjoyed it. So many of you on the webinar may know me. I attend a lot of the classes. I go to a lot of the networking events and I've really enjoyed it. And I've learned a lot from you guys as well. So I really appreciate that. My contact information is here in case you have any questions on self-directed accounts for me. And as I go through, I'm gonna go just a couple of slides on Advanta and what a self-directed retirement account is. And then I'll bring Bill on to give you information that you guys are all waiting patiently for. So let's get started on that. Advana IRA is a self-directed retirement firm, meaning that we only handle qualified funds. So we help those people that have investments um, that they want to make that are outside of the market. So that's very important because brokerage firms are not willing to hold private investments like real estate, um, private lending. They don't want to do things with cryptocurrencies or gold and silver bars and coins. And so that's really where we come in. And we've been doing this for almost 20 years. What we do is hold the retirement account for you. You find the investment. We help you get it done in the name of the IRA, 401k, HSA, ESA. And I'll talk about the types of accounts in just a second. We have um, just under $2 billion in assets under management. I do need to update this slide, but we have grown substantially over the last few years. We have around 8,500 clients with us, and we have two offices. We can help anybody anywhere. So although we're located really in the Tampa Bay area of Florida and Atlanta, Georgia, we have clients nationwide and even worldwide. And so those individuals that might even be outside of the U.S., as long as you have a U.S.-based retirement account, you can make those investments that you would like to. And your investments can also be outside of the U.S. So I have a lot of clients invested in land in, um, for example, Costa Rica and Belize, and we have clients invested in Panama and India. So it's really where you guys want to make those investments. Something that we don't do, although we do talk a lot about investment strategies and the rules for investing in different investments that we've seen, we do not provide investment, legal, or tax advice. If you have questions of that nature, please ask anyway, and we'll go ahead and maybe refer you over to a professional that can help you if it's a question that we can't answer. But we do classes every week, and a lot of those classes will include information on things you can and can't do in a retirement account. We won't talk today about the rules for those investments, but if you're interested in learning more, please let me know. I can send you a recorded webinar where we talk about the do's and don'ts of these types of accounts and strategies that we see. A lot of people have not heard about self-directed IRAs just very simply because there's not a lot of um, businesses out there like Advana IRA that will hold private investments. So brokerage firms, Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley, Fidelity, these are all great businesses, but they have made it a 
based on their business decision, they do not hold private investments. They're willing to help you with market-based assets like stocks um, and uh, mutual funds and bonds, but they don't want to hold anything that they feel is hard to value, they're not familiar with, and they have a fiduciary responsibility over the assets that they sell you. So they're unwilling to hold things like real estate. And so really we're not competing with those firms. We're just coming in and filling the gap in the industry where we will hold those private investments for you. And we actually don't hold anything publicly traded. We also don't sell you any investments. When your money comes over, it's ready for you to put to work and grow. The reason people typically will self-direct, and we have sort of the top three listed here, a new source of capital. Just very simply, people do not know that they can use retirement funds to make those investments that they know best. Um, you know, a lot of times they sort of look at it as like unlocking their retirement account and utilizing those funds for the things that they want to. And so that's probably the number one reason people reach out to us. They say, I wish I knew about you guys six months ago, or I wish I knew about you guys a year ago. I wouldn't have cashed out of my account, paid the penalties, paid the taxes, and made the investment that I wanted to make. It could have retained its tax status, essentially, and made an investment through a self-directed account. Another reason, of course, is start stock market fatigue. And, you know, it, it happens a lot where either the market is down, the market is up, or it's all over the place where people reach out to us and say, I just don't know what's going to happen. Can't see that far into the future where you know i'm just i would rather have a tangible asset something they can see touch feel they understand and it's not tied to the market necessarily and then of course the tax benefits having that account stay tax deferred or tax free depending on the type of account and um, receiving you know rental income or um, mortgage interest payments back to their ira depending on their tax status the different types of plans and the reason i like to always include this is because a lot of times people will say to me, I, I can't self-direct my account because it has to be a Roth IRA. And I'm not really sure where that comes from. I do hear that a lot. But the truth is, if it ends in IRA, it can be self-directed. And a lot of times, um, you know, people prefer one account or the other, depending on what they're looking to do. A tax deferred account is a great account because of the deductions you get. A Roth account is a great account because it can be tax free at retirement. And so there's a lot of options available to you. But the most important thing to remember is that if it ends in IRA, you can self-direct it. If you have an old employer plan, that can be self-directed. A solo 401k, so if you're self-employed, you're um, an entrepreneur, you have a small business, no employees, you can have a solo 401k and that can be self-directed. And then you'll see up here, I also have health savings accounts and education savings accounts. And very simply, the rules for self-directing those types of accounts are going to be exactly the same as retirement accounts. And so we can hold and help you with those accounts as well. Um, I like to also point out the emphasis on former employer plan here, because when you're currently employed, you're a current participant in a plan, a lot of times the plan will not allow you to move any money out of the plan in order to self-direct. And so that's very important. Now, I always encourage people to check with the plan, but it's more likely that once you're no longer participating in the plan, that is when you can self-direct it. And I just want to go over some of the asset classes for you guys um, very quickly here. Um, the, basically, the IRS has given us two asset classes that you actually can't invest in. And so those, the, the only two asset classes are going to be life insurance and collectibles. And outside of that, the sky is just about the limit for making investments. There's also what they consider disqualified individuals or persons that you can't deal with when it comes to your IRA. Again, we're not going to get into that today, but I just want to give you guys an idea of what we're seeing in a self-directed retirement account. So those accounts um, basically can hold real estate, you can buy and hold, you can fix and flip, it can be long-term or short-term rentals, you can buy single family homes, condos, mobile homes or mobile home parks, you can invest in real estate syndications and private placements, um, you can use your IRA to buy tax liens and tax deeds, and then of course private lending, which is where our wrap loan presentation with Bill is going to fall. And there's all kinds of private lending, especially when it comes to a self-directed IRA. We see all types of strategies. And I know um, Bill, I think, was going to mention this as well, but the IRS actually does not require 
that the um, loan is secured by anything, um, including real estate. So it doesn't have to be, you know, secured by personal property. It doesn't have to be secured by real estate. It could be an unsecured note. It could be a first mortgage, a second mortgage, a third mortgage. Remember that the investment you're making is completely up to you and that you want to do your own due diligence on those investments, feel comfortable with your borrower, feel comfortable with the investment you're making. But it is typically something as long as it's for investment purposes that you can do in an IRA. And so now I'm going to bring Bill on and he's going to talk to us about wrap loans. And I know a lot of you guys have a lot of questions on the, this strategy. And I do consider it a little bit more of an advanced strategy and I get questions on it all the time. So I'm so glad that Bill was able to come on and join us for this today. How are you doing today, Bill? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much, Larissa, for inviting me today. So am I taking it from here now? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> well, good. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're located. I'm Bill Tan. I am located in Southern California, actually in the San Diego area. I'm a real estate and note investor. I have been for well over 30 years. <clears throat> and I have done just about everything in real estate uh, except development. And I've done just about everything in the note business. And I've been doing both of those, in including till today. And Today's presentation is all about pumping up your retirement account, particularly self-directed accounts. And there, oh, let me go back to the, there. I'm gonna, I'm adding this disclaimer too, which means don't believe a word I say. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. If you have any questions, talk to somebody you pay for their advice, okay? So with that, we will proceed onward. Maybe, maybe not. Ah, there. This is my contact information. It will be available again at the end of the presentation. And I'm going to start off here just assuming that most of you, most of the people that are here today know very little about the subject and about notes. So we're gonna start off right from the beginning, we're gonna set up a foundation and go from there, okay? So number one question, what is a note? A note is short for a promissory note or an IOU. There are secured notes and unsecured notes. Now, a secured note is one that's collateralized by an asset. Unsecured notes are not. So I asked if Larissa would at this point be able to sh offer a poll to our audience. And the question is, are there more secured notes or unsecured notes in the US and the world. And so Larissa, would you be able to share that and we could take a couple of seconds for people to quickly answer that? Yeah, we're gonna do it through the uh, question box, guys. So what do you guys think? Go ahead and type your answer into the question box there for us. So I see a couple of people answering. Are there more secured or unsecured? And I don't see an answer to that, so. It's actually divided almost 50-50. I see a lot of people popping up with secure. I see a lot of unsecured. I see more unsecured. Well, that's, yeah. I like it. I like it. Well, the answer is, to our question, ladies and gentlemen, is there are many, many more unsecured notes than secured notes in the world, U.S. and the world. Let me share with you an example. This is a unsecured note. If you will notice in the upper left-hand corner, it says Federal Reserve note. There is nothing that is actually securing the US dollar. Nothing that backs it up tangibly. It used to be at one point in our history that we had our dollars backed by gold and the gold was in the Fort Knox. And you could supposedly get $35 for every ounce of gold. In 1971, I believe it was, that uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard 
and now we are backed by the faith of the public in the goods and services that are produced by our country. And, and that's really all it is. It is just the faith of the people that this dollar has some value and that's backed up by the fact that our country produces goods and services. Almost all currencies in the world are unsecured notes. Now, examples of secured notes are planes, trains, automobiles, or real estate. And today, we are going to talk about notes that are secured by real estate. Now, depending on where you're located in the country, when, a, when you, people borrow, a lien will be placed against the property that they're borrowing against. And if they do, then the lender will, will place this lien and it will be either a deed of trust, if you're on the West, like I am, a mortgage where that's primarily on the East Coast, or a contract for deed, which is in the middle of the country. Now, the term mortgage is a generic term for all of these things. But you need to know where you are located in the country and your the a loan is secured by a deed of trust mortgage or contract for deed that's, that's the choices now the priority of those liens will be by when the loan was recorded and recorded like here on the in the west at the county recorder's office. And it, that's determined by a date and time stamp. Because when things are recorded, they're given a date and time. Conventional lenders want to be in first position. So they make sure that all previous liens are paid off before their lien is recorded. We're going to talk about a special kind of lien today. And it is a wraparound mortgage or AITD. Now, an AITD is uh, stands for an all-inclusive trust deed and that's used in deed of trust states primarily in the west and it means that it includes other trust deeds and their notes so notes are secured against properties by a deed of trust in the west mortgage in the east or contract for deed in the midwest now why does a lender feel the need to secure a lien against the property they're lending on and the truth of the matter is the only reason they do that is because they don't trust the borrowers to pay them back and since they don't trust the, bo the borrowers to pay them back they need a process by way that if the borrowers do not make the payments, that there's a penalty to be in, involved, and they will lose the asset that they borrowed the money against. So this next slide is a visual representation of a wraparound mortgage, okay? So consider the wraparound mortgage as a first, and the first is then wrapped around by a second. So a wraparound mortgage is not a first lien, it is always a junior lien. So that's how they work. Basics of this wraparound mortgage is you must have an amortizing, which means that the loan is getting smaller with each payment, or an interest only first mortgage, and you are surrounding that with another note and lien, deed of trust, mortgage, but we're gonna just use the term mortgage from now on, because we're talking about wraparound mortgages. So here's the example that we're gonna work with today. And this is a wraparound mortgage example using a hard money first. Now, if you're not use knowledgeable, a hard money first is e easier to get than a conventional loan because the hard money 
lender is only interested in the value of the asset that they're lending against, real estate. So they're only interested in the value of the real estate, so they will only lend so much against the value of the real estate. So in this example, and I did these over 40 times, I'm gonna use an example from the 90s. And the reason is because that is a much more uh, impressive example to understand. These people would come to me. I was a broker back then. I'm no longer, I retired from that. Uh, they would come to me and as a broker, I would find people who needed money and marry them up with somebody who had money. Now, borrowers would come to me and they say, I need most, almost all these are flippers, okay, fix and flippers. They say, I need $100,000 to fix up this property and flip it. And I would say, you don't need $100,000, you need $101,000. And I never had, not one of them ever say, okay, no, I only need 100,000. They would say, okay, I will, I'll take the 101,000. And the reason we're doing this is because I wanted to pump up my self-directed IRA. And here's the process by which we do it. We would create two loans. I would get $100,000, which would be supplied by an investor, which in this example, her name is Linda. And that would be in first position. It would be recorded in first position. And then we'd create a second note using $100,000 from my IRA, self-directed IRA, which would wrap the first 100,000 and create a $101,000 note. And the reason I would do that is because it benefits from extra interest from the underlying $100,000. If I created a second position note, let's say at 10%, I would get $100 at the, if it's a 10% note, I would get $100 in interest at the end of one year. I'm gonna show how we can do better than that. So here's my example. So we created a first with Linda's money. And as you can see, it was one year in length. The borrower, Frank, paid 10% interest only. And he didn't make any payments. He just paid it all off in one year. And on this note, the interest, the annual payment is $10,000. So it's a 10% interest on 100,000. At the end of one year, Linda would be getting 100,000, excuse me, her original loan back of 100,000 plus $10,000 in interest. I then created a second position note of 101,000, which as you can see, includes Linda's 100,000 inside of it. And I used 100,000 from my self-directed IRA. One year, same, same length, 11% interest only. And at the end of that year, Frank would make one payment to me of 101,000 repay, repaying back the note plus interest of 11%, which would be $11,110. I would then take, and this is what it looks like. So I created $101,000 note. If you subtract out Linda's 100, I got it by using 100,000 from my self-directed IRA. At the end of one year, Frank paid me $11,110 in interest, plus my $101,000 note. I would then take $10,000 of that 11,110, pay off Linda. Was Linda happy? Linda was ecstatic. She didn't have to do anything to receive that money. And that left $1,110 cash flow, for me, now $110 doesn't sound uh, maybe all that sexy, but let's let's see what uh, it looks like. And by the way, understand that this is a common practice throughout the country. It's just not used very often and it's legal. So if that's one of the questions, just understand, it's as legal, it's common practice. So this is what it looked like. Now to hey, figure Bill, out what 
We did have a question pop up, but I didn't know if you were going to talk about the paperwork. Are you going to talk about the paperwork on this as well, or should I ask the question? I didn't intend to talk about the paperwork, but I'd be more than happy to talk about the paperwork. It depends on where you're located. Uh, in the West, we have what are used escrow companies, and in the East Coast, you guys have closing tables where attorneys mostly do the closings. Here on the West Coast, we use an escrow company. All the documents are put into it with an escrow company. They they handle the money. I would not touch the money at all. Uh, the documents would be there's an IOU, two IOUs created, one for 100,000 to Linda, 10%, interest only, one year. It would be secured by a mortgage in first position. My second position note, my wraparound mortgage, would be, uh, I would have a $101,000 note, and it would be secured in second position behind Linda's first. And do I'm you not use sure any specific if that's, wording? Um, I'm sorry? Yeah. Do you use any specific wording for the second note to show that it's um, in second position and specific to the wrap? I always put that in so that everybody knows everything. Don't want anything to be hidden. I, I make everybody aware of everything, and it's recorded so people can see that. Any other questions? So why would a potential borrower um, want to do this? Well, because they need the money, okay? It, to them, it's just one loan. They're making one payment to me. So to them, in all sense and purposes, it's one loan, they need the money. I'm doing it this way in order to benefit my self-directed IRA, to pump up my self-directed IRA. When people get money, they're not all that caring where it comes from as long as they get the money and it's legal. And we're doing all this legally. Uh, if you use a self-directed IRA, now the self-directed IRA is the one that sends the money to the escrow or, or attorney okay the note would be in the name of the self-directed ira not me personally right larissa right exactly in, in the name of the ira and there is going to be a specific titling for your ira so if you're not with advanta um, you'll have to check with them if you are with advanta then you may be familiar it's advanta ira L, um, Advanta IRA Services or Administration LLC for benefit of your name and your account number and that specific titling is what's going to help demonstrate to the IRS that this is an investment of the retirement account and not yours personally. And understand that this doesn't have to be from a self-directed IRA account. You can just take $1,000 from your own savings and, and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whoever wanted to use a self-directed IRA because the whole idea is to pump up your retirement accounts. Are there any other questions? that I need to address? Um, let me see, I had one pop up here. Um, do you consider this doing work? I thought you really couldn't do work in your self-directed account. I am not personally, personally, individually receiving benefit. My IRA is receiving the benefit of my knowledge of being able to put two people together. I would not take, even though I was a broker, I would not take a commission on this because then that would, screw up my self-directed IRA by doing that. Right, Larissa? Right, exactly. And if you have more questions on the rules, you certainly can reach out to me directly. And like I said, we have webinars on the rules all the time. So, you know, many of your investments, although they're going to be considered passive, there's going to be a little bit there. I mean, you're still going to have to do your due diligence. You want to feel comfortable with the investment. You want to make sure that the paperwork is done properly. And there's going to be some steps for you to take. Um, the IRS hasn't really given us, you know, a clear cut answer as, you know, how far can you go and what is considered work, but some things are going to be more easily defined as others. Um, you know, if you're lending money, this is typically considered a passive investment for IRS purposes. Even though I put some mental work into it. Right. So you can benefit from your mental processes in your self-directed IRA. You just can't physically get the tangible benefit to yourself individually. Your IRA can get the benefit legally. Right, your IRA can always benefit, exactly. Um, 
we did have a few more questions pop up. Do you ever net fund the interest from the loan proceeds to make sure you get uh, the full annual yield um, and you're not paid off early? Uh, in, in this, let me not address that one. I, I would be happy to at another time. I'm okay. just doing this to make this easy. Uh, we'll say in this instance that they couldn't pay me off before the one year was up. How's that? Got it. Thank you. Okay, okay um, let's let's go on to you, Bill. And I did have a few more questions pop up, but and we will get to these questions. But let's um, do a few more slides, and then I'll come back to these. And thank you guys for submitting your questions. Oh, please submit the questions. I love the questions. And after uh, I'm providing you, by the way, two examples. One of which is to blow up your self-directed IRA. I'm doing a second example, and I am certain that there's going to be questions about that one too. So to refresh memory. Uh, Frank borrowed $101,000 total, $100,000 from Linda's and $1,000 from my self-directed IRA. At the end of one year, he paid out $101,000 in notes. I, $1,000 of that went to my self-directed IRA, $100,000 went back to Linda, plus he paid $11,110 in interest, $10,000 of that went to Linda, $1,110 of that went to my self-directed IRA. Now, $1,110 isn't a lot, but let's see what my return on my investment was. And as, as we can see right in front of here, the cash flow from our uh, loan was $1,110. If you divide that by my original investment was of $1,000 and you multiply that times 100%, my yield was 111%. That was my return on my investment. Isn't that and a I, great return? What? Yes. And I, yeah, I just wanted to clear that up because there was a question on that. Um, for those of you wondering, the interest payment total for the year was $1,110. That does not include the original principal balance of the second mortgage, which was 1000 Is that correct, Bill? Correct. I said that 100 the, of the 101,000 we got repaid or the loan out. 100 went to Linda, and 1,000 went directly back to my self-directed IRA. I'm now talking about the interest portion. There was 11,110 dollars in interest. 10,000 that went to Linda. 1,110. Now that's the interest that was on the 101,000. If I had just done a second of a thousand dollars, I would have only gotten 110 at 11 percent. I would have only gotten 110 dollars. But by using a wraparound mortgage and the special benefits of that, I got 1,110 dollars instead of 110. So I I benefited from using Linda's money, who wasn't even my own. I made money on somebody else's money. This is the wonderful part about a wraparound mortgage. And so my yield on my original $1,000 was 111%. Isn't that a great return? I mean, really. But wait, there's more. If if it'll if it'll go for it. There. But wait, there's more. Because the whole idea is to pump up my self-directed IRA, and we're going to do some pumping. So pump, 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 and ay, 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 slow today. The actual interest rate on that note that we created for Frank was not 11%. Back then, the going rate was 15%. So we got 15%, not 11% on my $1,000, and let's see what my return was then. So 15% of a $101,000 note in second position was $15,150. If you subtract out Linda's $10,000, that remain, remains, the cash flow is $5,150. If we then figure out my yield, $5,150, divide that by original, my original investment of $1,000, multiply that, times 100%, comes up with a yield of $515,000. Ladies and gentlemen, that is terrific return, isn't it? Ah, but wait, there's still more. There's even more. 
because when you create a hard money loan, they charge fees. And back then, the fees were 10 points. So to get that loan, Frank had to pay 15% and 10 points. Now, in today's marketplace, there's much more money available, and so the fees are and interest are less. However, just think about this example and how you could apply it to where you are. But I just want you to show you the, how this was done. And I did over 40 of these deals, almost exact same numbers. So his loan fee was 10 points. Each point was 1% interest of the loan. So my yield actually was 15% interest plus 10 points, which is 10% of 101,000, which gives us a total of $25,250 in interest and points. If you subtract out the $10,000 that Linda got, that leaves $15,250 for my cash flow and There. My return, my annual return was 1,525%. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why I love notes and why I love wraps. I know you probably have questions, but I'm, I didn't get an answer if I had a hard 60 minute time frame here. So let me go on to the next example, unless there's yeah. some some burning questions that somebody that people have right now yeah let me let me address a few questions so that um any of those people that are looking for answers to the, this actual example will get those answered um somebody did ask if big banks allow you to wrap their loan uh some do some don't don't always if unless it's in the not um verbiage of the first that they they don't allow it then they they don't however in actual practices if they're safe i haven't had any lender say no now the reason they don't want to do it is they don't want it when they initially fund a loan they don't want a second behind that because they've done all their underwriting to make sure that they're going to get paid and if you come in with a second behind their original first initially for conventional loans okay this loan was not this example did not include conventional financing. This was private party financing. But let, I've never had a lender say no if they were in a safe position. And will this work with seller financing? Absolutely. I am actually going to show an example of that in the next example. Imagine that. Good question. <laughs> Great. And then a question on what if the borrower defaults? Uh, how does that work with the second position and uh, you know foreclosure and, and all the stuff that goes along with it? Certainly. If, a, if the borrower defaults and doesn't make the payments, then the, the lender in second position must make the lender in first position satisfied with payments. Otherwise, the first position will initiate a foreclosure and they could actually foreclose the second out. So you'll protect your position and then go through, proceed with the foreclosure yourself. And by the way, before this started, uh, I was talking with Larissa and there was, a, there's an article that uh, today, for those of you in Florida, that Floridians can expect a lot of foreclosures coming in the near future. So that's just a side. And just and just so everybody knows, I did just uh, post to the chat information on upcoming events and the newsletter that um, Bill is talking about. So if you look into the chat, you'll see a bunch of links there. So if you want to join Bill for any of his upcoming events and also classes, you have the ability to do so. Just go ahead and check out the chat. Um, I had a couple more questions on this one, um, on this example, Bill. How about um, did Linda receive points? Did you get all 10 points? How did you guys work that out? In this example, I got all the points. Now, that can be that's worked out between sometimes between the me and the second position or first. Sometimes you the first the, the person put up the large amount of money 
might ask for some points too. Okay. It's all negotiate, negotiated between the lenders. And, and do you ever get objections? There's, the golden, there's the golden rule where the person has the gold might make the rules, right? <laughs> right. And do you ever get objections from the um, first person lien holder? And I, I think this would really more apply if there was already a first position mortgage in place and you were going to come and wrap it after the fact. In this example, I believe you created both the first and second at the same time, but what if there's a first in place already and you are going to come and wrap that first? Would you ever get an objection from the first position lien holder? It, it's none of their business. Uh, that was addressed earlier when they said, you know, hey, does, a, does the first allow a second behind it? Okay. And we're going to do that in the next example, by the way. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it? Okay. Okay, here's example number two. A reminder of the program basics, you want a fully amortized, low in, lower interest mortgage on a property. By the way, uh, right now, we have interest rates that are historically low. So a wraparound mortgage for people in the future who come into having problems, this is why you want to learn about this wraparound mortgage, is because you want to take advantage of this lower interest mortgage that are currently out there. Okay, so fully amortized, lower interest mortgage on the on the property in question. You, in this instance, you're going to purchase this property for zero down, subject to the existing loan. Subject to the existing loan means that there's already an existing loan, and in this case, there's a conventional loan on this. And in this particular instance, this is where the property is now the same value as what is owed against us, which has happened before, and it's gonna happen again in the future, okay? And then uh, what did, you're gonna buy it for zero down, subject to the existing loan, and then you're gonna turn around and sell it with a, by you providing the financing, you providing the seller financing at a higher interest rate and longer term financing. In this example, we're going to buy a $300,000 single family residence. Now I chose 300,000 because that is the median price of properties that are sold throughout the country. Here on the West Coast, 300,000 will get you an outhouse in the back. They call them ADUs. No, <laughs> an ADU by the way is a granny flat. Um, um, I can't think of the ADU term right now. Uh, accessory dwelling unit. And that is, by the way, that's an, if you have own property, that's another way to add income to it by adding a granny flat in the back. That was a sideline. So in this example, purchasing a $300,000 single family residence for zero down because they owe the same amount as the value of the property. It's very difficult for somebody to sell a house when they owe as much as the value because then they have to come out of pocket to pay closing costs a lot of people, when they get in that position, can't come up with the closing costs. Mm -hmm. We'll just go with this example right now. So we're buying it for zero down, okay? And we're gonna make $308.95 a month in positive cash flow by buying a house for zero down and turning it around and selling it by providing seller financing to the next buyer. How to wrap it? We're buying it subject to the existing loan for 300. So there's an existing loan of 300,000. And in this particular property, the current property value is 300,000. The monthly payments on this loan are $1,432.25. And it's been in place for five years. It had a 4% interest rate, which was what loans were going for five years ago. They are unable to refinance it either due to their credit or the fact that lender does not want to lend, refinance 100% of the value of a property. And then we're going to buy this for zero down, and then we're going to sell it on a wraparound mortgage for the same amount, 300000 And we're going to benefit from our knowledge of $308 a month. So we're going to provide seller financing 30 years for the new buyer, 30 years. Now remember, there's 25 years of payments remaining on the original loan on this property, and we're gonna provide a 30-year financing. By the way, it could be more than that. And if you wanna learn how to play what-if what games, 
I'm happy to teach a course on that. If you don't know how to use a financial calculator, by the way, I'm doing a free, free uh, basics of how to use a financial calculator tomorrow night, Thursday night. That would be at uh, 7 p.m. Pacific. Going forward, I chose to sell this property for a 30-year term to the new buyer at 5.7% interest and a monthly payment of $1,741.20. And I chose that because I wanted at least $300 monthly payment. And that monthly payment is the, a monthly payment that the new buyer can afford. That's most important. The new buyer must be able to afford the payment. Our payday is, whoa, <laughs> our payday is when we collect our cash flow of $308.95. So Larissa, when you did this, it reformatted that sucker. And our cash flow is when the people pay us this $1,741.20, subtract out when we have to make the payment to the first of $1,432.25. $308.95 is the difference. I chose $308. You can choose whatever you're comfortable with when you learn how to use a financial calculator. I also want to point out here too, Bill, because I think we'll probably get this question, but if you're using an IRA, how, do the, how does the payment work back to the first position? Um, there's a couple different ways I've seen clients um, do this, and, and Bill, maybe you can touch on how you would handle it, but sometimes the payment will come as one check, and it will be deposited to the self-directed IRA, and then the self-directed IRA will pay the first position mortgage as an expense to that asset. The other way I see it done is simply having your borrower write two checks, um, uh, and so those no. are the two ways that I see it. There's a third way. <clears throat> Sorry. Whoa. <clears throat> There's a third way, and this is the one I use and I recommend. Use a neutral third-party servicing company. The borrower pays the servicing company. The servicing company divides the money up, sends a check to the first mortgage holder and the, the remaining balance to the self-directed IRA account. And Perfect. there's a fee for doing that, but it's safer for everybody involved. Perfect. And then there was a couple of questions that I wanted to address from a, a few different people asked the same question. What are the um, market or, or sort of going rates for points versus interest? And I'll just share my my opinion on that. It's, it is going to depend where you are. It Absolutely. is largely based on your location. And so, you know, what we're seeing here in the Tampa Bay area of Florida is different with, than what my colleagues and investors are seeing in Atlanta, Georgia versus what Bill is seeing in California. So that those questions are really something you want to address with local investors. If you want to see sort of what the market will will hold or bear, then that is sort of what you want to do in order to figure that out. And another question popped up on how you find um, borrowers or how you find these these types of investments. And my recommendation is always networking. You know, you you can. Talk about wanting to do it all day long, but the best way to get started if you're not already doing that is networking with local groups in your area. And then, like I said, Bill um, gave us some links to some um, RIAs and stuff that he's going to be a part of in the next coming, uh, the upcoming weeks. And I always suggest networking and, and working with people that are seasoned investors and asking them those questions and, and finding your borrowers in your local area or wherever you're comfortable lending. Bill, what are your thoughts? Wow, there was a lot there. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a, it's a, okay. The points and, and and interest rate are a function of supply and demand. Right now, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money looking for a home, and they're competing with each other to find good investments. If you can find a good investment, you are gold to these people. Uh, I my previous example back in the '90s. Self-directed IRAs were not well known, so there was fewer money chasing deals. And so you could command a higher interest rate and higher points. Right now, a lot of money chasing deals, lower interest rates, lower points. However, since you are doing private money lending, it should always be higher than what conventional lenders do. It should always be higher than that. Uh, what else was uh, uh, finding what, finding uh, the investments? Oh, f uh, finding finding the the borrowers, the buyers, 
that was easy. What I would do is I would find houses that were renting in the area and I would just send letters to the people. Would you rather own than rent? You know, you love the area. Would you rather own a property here or rent it? That was really simple. And I would get a flood of people to say, oh, yes. Where's it? You know, what's the house? You know, I say, here it is. And they go look at it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, we had a question on um, subordination. Hold on, let me go back up to that. Um, do you have a subordination agreement executed between the RAP and the FIRST? A subordination agreement? Yeah, in this case, I don't necessarily it think it applies. It doesn't apply here uh, because it is recorded behind the, the existing loan anyway, so it's in second position. It's a junior lien, so you don't have to ask the a subordination agreement is where there's an existing loan and you ask them to go behind your new loan. Now, I have been asked by conventional lenders if I would subordinate to their new loan, and I have done that in specific interest instances, and I got some benefit out of it. Either I got a pay down on what was owed to me, or the interest rate was changed, or the longer term, I would. it's all negotiated. And um, is is the reason the borrower uh, would agree to um, the higher interest rates because they can't get a bank loan, or what are some reasons that um, you would be able to work with a borrower either, you know, regardless of whether it's first or a second or a wrap um, with the hard money mm -hmm. type of interest rate? So uh, right now, it's fairly easy to get a refinance if you currently own a property and you have enough equity and you can qualify it is very much easier to get to refinance a property right now it is very difficult to get purchase money mortgages and because it's very difficult for buyers to get new loans this offer this offers us a vast number of people who can't qualify for conventional loans who would be our target for seller financing a very good target for seller financing. Question? No, that's. I think that that's okay. it. Um, guys, continue me, to me, go ahead and, and post me, your questions, and we're going to keep going me, here. Then let me continue here. So, well, they make the payments to refresh. They make the payments of seventeen hundred forty-one dollars to me, and then, or the servicer, like I said, to make it the servicer, and then the servicer pays off the first, and the difference goes to either me or my self-directed IRA, it depends on how you set it up. As long as I did not personally get money out of the initial transaction that I created between when I sold the property, uh, then this can be dealt with in my self-directed IRA. One more thing, and this is a big thing. Any principal pay down on the wrap is tax-free. Now, principal pay down means it's as if I made a new $300,000 loan to the borrowers. Even though no money came out of my pocket, I created this note out of thin air. Any principal paid on any amount of that loan that makes the $300,000 lower, that is tax-free. It is called return of principal. This has not been challenged by the, by the IRS, and I have done this, and I know other people have done this, and this is a wonderful, wonderful thing about wraps when you create the seller financing. One more last thing. After 25 years, the first is paid off. And the entire $1,741.20 is all yours. Or, or you can ask them to pay you off. So there's a remaining balance because of the amortization of a higher interest rate. In a longer term, there's a remaining balance on the AITD mortgage of 90000 So as the 300000 first was paid off in 25 years, because we provided financing at a higher interest rate and longer term, there's still $90,000 remaining, $90,717. And if you convince the buyer to refinance and pay you off now, that $90,000 is $90,717 is tax-free return of principal. So what I would do is when I would create these wraparound mortgages, every night I'd say in my prayers, 
dear Lord, please don't let him pay me off. Okay, please don't let him pay me off. Please don't let him pay me off. Because the difference between the first and my second is growing with every payment that's being made. And I want that amount to be larger and larger because that's going to be tax free to me. Now, folks, here's the, here's the commercial and I'll make it quick. <laughs> like I said, um, I have a free hands-on workshop tomorrow. It's an introduction to the financial calculator. It does not go deep into the nuts and bolts of how to do what if games and about finance. It's just how to use the finance basics on how to use the financial calculator. I'll teach you how to figure out a mortgage payment, a, a car payment, and so forth like that. It's free. Uh, there's how you can uh, the link to do it. I believe it was put in the the chat box. And it's tomorrow, July 8th, 7 p.m. Pacific. I'm later on this month, I am teaching an all-day interactive class on Zoom. So it doesn't matter where you are on how to use it's real estate finance one-on-one using a financial calculator. It's all day interactive. All my classes are money back guarantees. Uh, you will, I promise you will learn things that you don't know. And even if you're knowledgeable, I, you will relearn things and I will show you some other things. Uh, we will cover everything from annuities, uh, note brokering, uh, how to buy notes at a discount, how to fact, figure out how to do that, as well as figuring out all the aspects of a note, such as the term, the interest rate on, on investment, uh, pay, monthly payments and remaining balance, a lot of things. I, I've been told that this is this is if you're expecting to do any financial things, not just real estate finance, this is a must take class. Other people said it, not me. And then if you take that class, there's a, a week later, there's we go into more advanced subjects on how to real estate finance. And then later this year, I am going to maybe maybe not there. If it advances, I will be, and if it doesn't, I won't. Oh, here, Bill, I got it. There you go. <laughs> she cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to post some things to the chat. I think you can get to it now. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to be I, I'm going to be teaching a creative real estate financing techniques and solutions class. Halloween weekend, okay? And this is this one will change the way you think about real estate investing. You'll learn things you never, I promise, never heard of before it will teach you how to make money with no money of your own even if you have no money and many many other things and uh oh yes i i run a real estate club my next meeting is next wednesday and it's at the second wednesday of every month if you google la ria we're the third one down in meetup <clears throat> excuse me and there's a link there there's probably a link in the chat uh we have people from all over the country because it is education and networking focused and lastly here's my contact information you're welcome to come to me with any questions you might have i love to answer questions i will tell you right ahead of time this is how i answer questions first things first our family family comes first secondly <laughs> then if uh, a message comes in, if it has to do with making money or if it's going might cost me money, that's those I address second. Thirdly, I address my students, and then lastly, everybody else. So I may, give me 24 hours to get back to you if you have any questions. More than happy, I am a teacher at heart, and I am grateful to Larissa and Adventa for giving me this platform to share with you today. Any Thank you so much, Bill, for joining us. And I just want to mention that I did just post um, the events that Bill was talking about. There was a couple others here, so I'm gonna post them real quickly um, so that you guys can get the information instead of um, trying to write it down from the slides, it'll be in the chat box for you. So hold on one second, let me get those posted. Um, and then the copy of the slides are available. And yep, and the, the slides are attached as a handout. So thanks for reminding me, Bill, yep, they're there. Um, for everybody, if you um, wanted a copy of the slides, go to your handouts in the control panel and on your right-hand side of your screen, you'll be able to download the slides. 
this will also be, um, the recording will be posted and once it's posted, it'll also be shared with everybody because you registered um, to your inbox. So it will go to YouTube. It's also in our resources for um, Advana IRA and you'll get a copy of the recording. Um, I don't send handouts with the recording, so if you want them, download them here. Um, if you can't, for whatever reason, download them, just send me an email and I will make sure to send them out to you, so just let me know. Um, can you, Bill, there, a question popped up on your um, classes. Can you confirm the dates of the basic and advanced classes? And I think I posted them all here sure. in the chat box, but um, if you have them, go ahead and just read them off. Okay, uh, my Real Estate Finance 101 will be July 24th. And if they can't make it, just send me an email to get on the mailing list because I will. I do have those throughout the year. Uh, the Real Estate Finance 102, you must take Real Estate Finance 101 in order to get into that one. I do that once a year. Last time I did it was last September. That will be a week later, July 31st. And then my creative real estate financing techniques and strategies will be Halloween weekend. That's October 30th and 31st in uh, of this year. Uh, just an FYI for your information, I will be offering a beginning class on notes sometime between the middle of September and the end of the year. And after the new year, I will be offering an advanced financing techniques and strategies class. That is uh, scheduled right now for January 29th and 30th of 2022. Okay, perfect. Let's and the, I must take the creative real estate financing techniques and strategies. Okay. Class. And I just want to say also that I see on here, um, there's a testimonial from one of Bill Tan's students. Um, just it, my policy is not to share names from the chat, so I'm not going to do that, but I will read you the testimonial. Um, I'm a Bill Tan student who has taken the free workshop, the 101 workshop, and now signed up for 102. I highly recommend Bill's classes. So I just wanted to read that for you guys. Um, I had some questions. Okay, also they're, on they're groupie. I don't know who it is. They're a groupie and I didn't pay them enough. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's not reading. <laughs> Bill's not reading the question box. It's just me. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention to you guys that if you're asking me for um, referrals, um, referral sources, please email me um, because it is going to depend on where you are and what you're looking for. Um, so I'm not going to take any more time up to share that information. But if you're asking me for attorneys, CPAs, um, things of that nature, please go ahead and send me a quick email and let me know um, what it is you're looking for and i'll let you know also if i have those resources to share um and i don't they may, really try, think... they may try a local real estate investment club investors club mm -hmm. yep absolutely absolutely and there's a lot out there also before we sign off i do want to mention that we have advanta ira has many um upcoming events as well and so i did sneak in my slide here for our education um we have webinars just like this one with Bill Tan. We have a lot of them coming up um, for you guys to join and also our own networking events. If you haven't joined us for our Pitch, Promote, and Prosper events every other Friday, please do so. The next one is this Friday. It's at noon Eastern time. The link is on our website under advantaira.com forward slash events. Everybody has the opportunity to introduce themselves and pitch a property or talk about an investment, talk about what they're looking for, or pitch services they provide. Again, everybody is welcome. It is a free event. Um, and we don't record it. So it, unlike our webinars, the, the Pitch, Promote, and Prosper events are not recorded for compliance purposes, but I would encourage you guys to join us. And even if you don't want to um, introduce yourself, you're certainly welcome to pass and just listen in. And we have anywhere from 40 to 100 people signed on nationwide every other Friday. So that's this Friday. And you can find the information at advantaira.com forward slash events. Was there anything else, Bill? I do show up to your networking event occasionally. Yes, you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You do. And we appreciate everybody showing up because that just encourages us to continue them. And I know a lot of the country is opening back up to live events. 
But as long as we have interest, we'll continue to do them on Zoom. And, and there seems to be a lot of interest for that. So at this time, we don't plan on you know changing anything. We're going to continue to do them. If you're local to one of our offices, I know another question will be, when are we going to start networking at the offices again? It probably will be closer to the end of the year. We have talked about it. But for right now, we're going to at least keep Zoom. And then we might add um, networking at the offices later in the year. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us. I appreciate your questions and your attendance, and we hope to have you on another event soon. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. Truly appreciate it.